Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Jared? I'm good, thank you. You've got a lovely backdrop again. <laughs> this is, um, that's the, the southernmost part of Australia. Is it? Yeah, and the South Coast track in Tasmania. I went there with my son for his 16th birthday. We, oh. we took a week to hike around and it was an amazing part of the world. So nice. In fact, straight, like, straight ahead there, that's, there's no land in between that point until you get to Antarctica or, or the bottom of South America. That sounds like really, really cold water to me. <laughs> it, was cold, it was freezing. How have you been? Yeah, not bad. So we're, um, we've recently been released from lockdown. Um, yeah, it's, oh, it's epic, but what's happening now is that you've got a bunch of socially awkward people trying to reintegrate <laughs> society, trying to remember all the social etiquettes and stuff like that. So it's like, it's interesting because I've got um, half of my group of friends that are like caged animals that just want to hit the town and do it all and do yeah, it yeah. And then I've got another group of friends who are really like, oh, I don't know, there's a lot of people and <laughs> maybe we should, you know, wait a little bit before we go out again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, and it's also the thing that, um, that like, you, you, ca- like you, you catch up with a mate. Like I, I kept having a coffee with a, um, some, caught up with someone yesterday and um, they're not a bestie, but they're sort of like a colleague, but really awesome we get on. And it was that thing of like, uh, do I, do you reach into the, like, what am I yeah. doing? Like, what are we doing? I know. Everyone's like, do we do the kiss thing or do we do the, like, social elbow high thing or what's going on here? Yeah. And I actually, uh, who was I talking to? Oh, I was talking to my partner and she was like, um, made this really interesting observation that's that it's sort of that, it's a real unconscious bias thing where it's like, you're talking about like a, there's a bug going around that does give no fucks who you are. Yeah. But if you're my bestie, I'm going to reach in for a cattle. <laughs> and it's like because there's there's some sort of a thing that says, yeah, but, but because they're your friend, I'm sure they're going to be fine. It's like, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, I'm sure if aliens are watching us, they're going, these guys have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> like they're yeah, looking yeah, at yeah. Our government leaders and how we're managing COVID and just going, I don't know, these guys, we, maybe we should just reset the whole thing. <laughs> they don't seem like they get it. <laughs> Well, maybe it's happening. Like, you know, with that stuff in the States and stuff, like, it's it's really interesting. Like, yeah. it's sort of, like I've got, I don't want to get either optimistic or pessimistic, but it's kind of, what if we did start to get people that cared about other people and we just let them run with it for just a little bit? Like, you know, it, it, maybe it might work out. <laughs> Crazy thought, right? And of course it is, and, and and it's um and yeah, it may, it may just be like serendipity and a bunch of things landing. But you know, the Australian Senate just voted to have Australia, uh, sorry, Australia, um, and was it carbon neutral by twenty thirty five? I think they've said, hmm. and that's because next week they're going to be launching this climate um, uh, think tank or initiative. And that's ahead of like tomorrow. They're going to be. Um, it's because the tomorrow. I think the CR, CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology release their climate annual climate report. And all that has been. You know, while all that's been going on, Australia's caught on fire, and then there's been the Royal Commission and all these. Like, and it's it's kind of looking like there's just no way that they can keep ignoring some of these really big problems. And no. I'm stoked. It's just yeah, like, it's kind of like. <laughs> but you feel, you're right. It feels like it's hit a tipping point where yeah. I think that, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, these voices were seen as like woke or, you know, like goody two shoes or Pollyanna. But now it's actually um, the discussion's becoming a lot more acute in terms of um, at a policy level and at an institutional level. Yeah. And there's a huge groundswell of support. So I'm absolutely stoked that there's um, pressure for it to move this fast. And I think um, in terms of implications for Australia, like without getting stuck into it, I think Biden being elected will force, I think, our government to be more active on climate change as well. Yeah, and it's, and, and like, so with the next election coming out, like, um, was I was looking at some stats and, um, you know, so 67% of Australians believe that climate change is a big deal and we need to do something about it. Um, the Biden um, I think it was something like 61 or 69% of 18 to 25-year-olds voted for him. 
Yeah. And you see similar representations of those sort of ethics going into the younger voters now. So you've got this, this we're at this point where there's more people in Australia that think like this and want this to happen than don't. And that number is growing with the next, with the, with the generation that's coming up. So it's like, if Labor and if, they, if either one of them didn't put some sort of forward thinking climate related strategy on the table, you'd have to be wondering what the fuck is going on there. Like how would, like, yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I think in like a couple of years time, or it's certainly at least in five years time, we're going to be looking back at this period of time when COVID hit and what the responses were from certain companies and institutions. And it'll be a case study for who did shit and who didn't. Yeah. <laughs> because like, um, and even, you know, what happened in the US with the election, it's going to be like a case study on how, you know, fascism nearly overturned a democracy. And yeah, we don't yeah. feel it quite yet, but it came that close. And I think a lot of people don't realise it. Yeah, and with the the um, with the um, the Royal Commission into Murdoch and just all these things, it's like. But anyway, we could talk for hours about this. <laughs> <laughs> Probably need to organise a lunch or a dinner at some point when the borders open up, so we can actually. Oh yeah, for, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get stuck in then. Um, so Jared, you're currently the events and community lead at Canva, correct? Yeah, it's kind of changed. Has it? Um, so it's more sustainability lead, I think. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll jump yeah. into that in a moment because I, we, that's why we talked about sustainability last yeah. time. Um, but I didn't realise that you've had such a rich and varied career path, which you didn't mention in our last chat at all, which is kind of synonymous with a lot of humble people. So I didn't realise you're one of Australia's leading chefs, restaurateurs, authors, award-winning yeah. author and TV presenter. You've um, got 28 years experience in the food industry, working in the kitchens, owning restaurants, working as a retail food consultant and also a brand development chef. You also pioneered an award-winning restaurant called Down Street Depot, which was one of the first in Sydney to put farmers and chefs on the menu. Just wrote three award-winning cookbooks in your spare time. Um, you also launched a Sydney and Melbourne event called um, Metal Mouth with hatted chefs um, celebrating the love of heavy metal. And you've cooked at Dark Mofo for 5,000 people. And you knew that you wanted to be a chef at 11 years old and now you're working at one of the biggest tech companies in the world. Uh, so, yeah, classic underachiever. So I guess my first question for you is um, how did you know at such a young age, at 11 years old, that you had this passion for food? I really envy people that have that clarity with precision from such a young age. <sighs> um Wow, you make me tired when you go through that list. I'm sort of well, I'm tired <laughs> listening to your achievements as well. <laughs> I didn't really thought of it. Um, so I kind of fell in love with cooking, and it's got, it, it was a little bit weird, but I used to love co the comic books. And then um, the, there was a comic book called Wizard and Chips, a UK comic book, and they had um, and there was this cartoon of like the chestnuts, and the, everyone's eating like roasted chestnuts, and we had a chestnut tree at school, and I was just like, Ugh. Okay, so I chucked them in the oven and they all blew up and it made a mess. And and I was sort of like, really, I was, that just got me curious. Yeah. And then um, then I sort of started, um, and my mum cooked really, really basic, but really fucking beautiful food. And so I sort of got a little bit curious about cooking. And then, um, the, then one day I just sort of thought, well, I want to give this a crack, give it a go. And um, so um, I picked up um, it was my mum's Woman's Weekly magazine and there was a recipe in there for beggar's chicken, like a Chinese style chicken, which is cooked in, in um, like a salt crust. And, um, and so then like it, it was like, you know, so this is New Zealand years ago when it was yeah, really basic fare. And it took, we had to go around to different shops trying to find really crazy ingredients like cinnamon and star anise because, you know, and um and so I sort of, I did it sort of out of curiosity. And then I remember I made this one recipe and then I stuffed it up where I got the timing wrong. And then I ended up feeding people, my, like my mum, my sister at about, you know, quarter to 12 at night. And, um, but then I fed them and there was this really awesome feeling that I got when my like my mum took a bite out of the chicken and was just like, oh, this is so good. And it just smelled good. And, 
And then I sort of reflected on my day, and I was just like, it was like a, it was like a, um, it was like an adventure. It was like I sort of went through the process of like looking in in a magazine, and then having to go out on the adventure of finding the things, and 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 it was all new. And 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 then at the end of it, um, you know, one of the most important people in my life, I made her really happy, and I was just like, whoa. And that was when I first discovered that I'm actually really insecure and really needy. And, uh, and, all are. <laughs> yeah, and, it. And, and it was sort of that thing of cooking for people and making them feel good yeah. made me feel good. And, and it was sort of, um, and, and then it was kind of extended out to the fact that um, I, I grew up near a river, on a river sort of thing in, in a place called Upper Hutt, just outside Wellington. And so, we were never inside when the when it was light out. So it was always sort of playing in the water and going hikes and camping and stuff. And then the next sort of light bulb moment for me was sort of making the connection between food and nature. And 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 so from really early on, those actually from, from really early on, right up until today, like the things that make me most happy is a connection with nature and making people happy with food. And it's just that's kind of been the backbone for everything I've done. So awesome. So awesome. And I think that, you know, you can see why that you've got so much energy for all the things that you do, which we'll talk about later on, because it's driven from such a pure place and something that gives you so much joy because it gives others joy as well. Just yeah. to, it doesn't make it work, right? And it's like that. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and it's, a, it's like, I feel really lucky. Actually, I'm going through this really interesting phase in my life and my eldest son is making a decision about whether or not he leaves school early to um, start an apprenticeship and he wants to he's very clear and driven in what he wants to do and um, he's um, like he wants to be a, a carpenter and then get his building ticket and then build and he's always made things and he's really talented and awesome and I'm sitting here um, with going, no, you've got to go to school and you've got to go to university. You've got to get, and I'm doing the whole sort of like dad thing. And I left school as soon as I could to drive what I was, to pursue what I was most interested in. Yeah. And, and for most of my life, the most qualification, the biggest qualification I had was the driver's license in my pocket. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's a really interesting thing. Like I think that it's, yeah, sorry, I'm starting to go off on a tangent, but uh, oh. you know, when you're sort of trying to give advice, I'm, I'm, give, I'm giving advice to my son going, you've got to go to university and you get a degree, but knowing full well that it may not serve him because my journey has been really rewarding and awesome without that. So, so. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think that, you know, if you look at the um, laundry list of your achievements and your experiences, you've done all of that without a degree, right? Yeah, it was just, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, you can, if you just figure out what makes you happy and then just do that. Yeah. So, that, like, reflecting on all of those um, experiences, was there any that were particularly, particularly, I guess, formative or stand out for you? I, there's been, like, just so, like, just constant. There's, like, there's almost, it's really hard to sort of um, number the different sort of light bulb moments of or the, the pivots and the tweaks and all the different things that you discover when you go on the journey and stuff. But like, I think one of the, um, there was like a, a few, I think it was like 2006, I was selected to represent um, Australia in this um, slow food event in, in Torino, Northern Italy. Um, and it was called Terra Madre. And Terra Madre was, um, it was a five-day conference which had people from all around the world and they had something like 6,000 farmers and growers, um, fishermen, primary industry sort of representatives, um, 1,000 chefs and 500 academics all coming together to just talk about food. And the, that was just like, I mean, talk, that was just like, fuck. <laughs> It was just utopia. It was probably one of the coolest weeks of my life. It was just meeting people from, like this this um this guy from Chile that had you know travelled this huge dis distance to present to everybody at the um uh, at the this this um, conference um, his patent for a irrigation drip irrigation system 
um, and having a conversation with him about why he went to such great lengths to do this thing. And then he was like, you know, well, because I can see that the world's drying up. And I was like, oh, so are you suffering from drought? He goes, no, I'm fine, but there's less water than when I was a kid. And other parts of the world are drying up. But where, and I was like, well, but if you're fine, then why would you go to that length? And he goes, well, because I can do something that's going to help someone else. Yeah. And, and it was like, and just these, and there was a, um, um, uh, an amazing woman that gave this speech about, um, uh, about how the connection of food and the way that we play, the role that humans have in the ecosystem, that we, we sort of sometimes see ourselves as removed from the system, but we are a part of it. Like, you know, we die, we, we're carbon, we decompose, we, you know, all that, you know, we're just, so I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of it, but there was like those types of conversations where you're talking with really beautiful connected people who can see a really big picture really helps you have a sort of a bit more of a defined focus and appreciation for the small things that you do. Mm. And so when I had my restaurants, um, I would be, uh, in the back of my head, I'd always have this, um, I was on a mission to make the world better with food. Um, so I had this thing that, I'd, yeah, that was my little, my little um, mantra that I wrote on the back of, um, you know, my recipe books and stuff. It's like, you know, make the world better one mouth at a time. And so in the back of my head, I was always like, wanting to get political, wanting to talk about really big subjects, but I found that the best way to communicate it was to serve someone a perfect poached egg at breakfast. Yeah. And, and then because if I hit them with politics or I hit them with like, you know, climate change and all that sort of really heavy shit, then people, it, it's not very sexy. Like it's, <laughs> if you're not into it, it's like pretty boring. But if you give them a beautiful po poached egg and they go, oh, wow, what's your secret? Yeah, oh, well, it, it comes from this farm. Oh, okay, and then and they use biodynamic principles. Oh, it's biodynamics, and then all of a sudden you embark on this conversation. And what I'm hearing from you is that it's really just um, by you being yourself and talking about your passions and connecting with other connected people as well. You have a really, I guess, you have a, I guess, a greater sense or an expanded view, and also a clarity about what you're doing and how there's so many other people, I guess, that are like-minded but are doing things in adjacent capacities. Yeah, and, and I sort of sometimes think that, um, so, you know, when, though, if I'm giving advice to um, someone that's sort of starting out, then there's this real pressure to make sure you do the best thing or you do the most impactful thing or you do the, um, so, and, and, and I relate it to the, the sustainability work. So when you're developing, like, a, someone goes, I want to be more sustainable. And then they look at the list of things and it's like, oh, fuck, it's a big list. And it's like, well, no, you can actually whittle it down to one thing. Hmm. And you just do one of those things. And chances are somebody else has already thought about it. Somebody else may have already got an article about it, or there'll be some, there'll be, you know, it, it's, but, um, you know, pursue the, pursue the little things with an understanding of what the, not even an understanding, with an awareness that there's a bigger, bigger context to it. I understand. Yeah. So that's just, like you're clearly extremely passionate in this space around food sustainability and the connection to nature and how it can be, I guess, almost a bridge to help people kind of, you know, start to be more um, interested in things like that are a bit more difficult to confront, like climate change and sustainability. So how, and I think I read somewhere that um, people describe you as a food industry environmental sustainability warrior. <laughs> For the environment, and, and you touched on it, you want to you want to make the world a better place through food, one mouthful at a time. And you're also extremely passionate about um, putting the spotlight on local and seasonal sustainable foods, and yep. supporting smaller growers and farmers um, to come up with effective food and beverage solutions. So, how do you take all of those intrinsic passions and values, and um, bring them to life in the biggest tech company in the world, who are you know? Australia's largest um, privately owned company used by 85% of Fortune 500 companies, 20 million users in the world whose ambition is to democratise design and empower creativity. Yeah. So how, does that, how do you fit into that? And what does your role, your current role, which sounds like it's evolved as well to include a sustainability lens, um, what, what does that entail? Yeah, so it's probably a little bit of context because of the, um, the the work that I've also been doing in the last sort of five to six years has been um, like a um, focusing on developing master plans and strategies 
for the, specifically for the food and beverage industry, but not not at the restaurant level, more like at the council or organisation or you know, doing things like you know procurement strategies for um, for nationwide organisations, and and so one of the um, things that I um, had learned to do when you do when you're working as a consultant, working in um, with a wide range of different sort of corporate entities or different types of organisations, you know, ranging from retail banks to councils, is that you, it's really important to be able to talk the language of the audience. And it's something that I learned, um, you know, it was something I learned subconsciously when I was doing cooking and, and doing restaurants or events. Like when I do, when we do an event for Metal Mouth, which is like just, it's a booze fueled noise fest. Um, the, the menu there, we can, we create a menu that is a theme for that. But if I'm doing like someone's wedding, it would, would be a different tone. It would be delivering to it. So um, the, the joining Canva for me was um, like, it was a really awesome opportunity. Um, and one of the things that I was really, um, taken by and still am like I've been here for eight and a half months and I'm still sort of going well the the values that um Canva have like the force for good be a good human these things they're not just chuck away words there's a lot of focus to actually articulate the values of the company into a highly profitable incredibly fast growing um tech company that is you know doing things like so you know democratizing design and and it's kind of it's a little bit heady because it's that thing. One of the other things that they say is that they, um, you know, Canva, they, when when, they, when you come up, you know, through the um, recruitment process and the and when you're a newbie, one of the things they say is that they, they want everybody to do the best work of their lives. So there's this real strong focus to make sure that um, the culture, the environment, the, you know, the desks, the, like everything that we need is there to give us the ability to deliver the best work of our lives. Um, the the way that I've gone from like you know owning a cafe to um, working in a tech company doing sustainability and and, um, and different initiatives there is that um, along my journey understanding how to articulate different things to different audiences um, in the last five years got really quite refined from being able to deliver financial reports um, being able to articulate um, not only a beautiful vision and get because I can talk underwater with a mouth of marbles about a bunch of stuff but how do you articulate that vision so the CFO can sign off on it so what you're saying is not just um, something that just makes people feel good while they've got their eyes on you and there was a lesson that I've learned over the years working with different NGOs and different charity work like everybody's into it when they're into it and when they're not it's just hard work like if if I was to ask people to um, volunteer to do something really awesome, um, unpaid, you have to put in a huge amount of effort to try and make sure that they're looked after and that they're having fun because otherwise they don't turn up. And it's like, and so the lessons that I've learned from working with NGOs and stuff is like, if we want to make the world different and want to make the world a better place, um, you can't go into it thinking that there's um, that there's ever going to be one silver bullet. There's never going to be a solution, and it's never going to be built off the back of nothing more than good intent. Like it actually has to. You need to be able to articulate a vision and a plan and a strategy that passes the scratch and sniff test, but also makes people feel really good and empowers them. So with the work we've been doing at Canva is that so with the culture and stuff, we've also got a really cool like food and beverage program. Like um, they've got a full kitchen team our breakfast and lunch is off off the charts. So the way that we've sort of gone into developing the strategy um, in the small steps is I just looked at the what we're purchasing through and then um, make sure that we've got a good relationship with the farm that we purchase our, our produce from but then also articulate um, the values of that food and beverage purchase, uh, you know, develop the matrix so that we can identify the different values. So it was like, um, is this good business sense to be buying from that farm? Yep, it's organic. Yep, it's, um, you know, it's telling a really good story about land regeneration. It has really great optics for the marketing engagement team. 
it's a really great way to um, encourage people to come to work to Canvas. So the talent acquisition people have got their piece. So it's it's a, it's um it's my skills of running little cafes and stuff and, and going through the sort of understanding how to deliver these really sort of key reports, but is also being also able to understand the value of the different parts of the message when different audiences are looking at it and then being able to give them the information that they need that's valid to that audience. Yeah, because you had a really interesting um, comment last time. You, you said you looked at sustainability from two lenses. So there's the environmental aspect of it. So obviously Canvas got a thousand employees worldwide. You provide free lunches and all that sort of stuff is going to be some element of food waste that you need to try to minimize. And I know you use method bins and food digesters to do that. But you also um, talked about the human aspect of sustainability in terms yeah. of managing people's, I think some people codify that as mental health or well-being and stuff like that, but you talked about it um, as an element of sustainability, which I thought was really interesting and really true. Um, and I know Canva have a number of initiatives that are very, um, I guess, engaging for the whole, the whole company. I think you do, like you have quirky themed season openers, you make sure that you celebrate milestones of teams. Um, people are always, I guess, made to feel encouraged to keep going. So, because I think in a lot of organisations, it's just um, get in the hamster wheel and run as fast as you can. And we might pat you at the end of the year with a pay rise. Whereas it kind of feels like you are very conscious about the human capital resource, I guess, of people at Canva. Yeah. yeah, and because the thing is that um, like there's heaps of hamster wheels at Canva. There's, like, it's just this, so it's, it is, um, yeah, we've, and we doubled in a year, uh, last year alone, just a head count. So there's just, it's, it's really busy. Um, it's also really, um, the, you know, the work is actually really cool and inspiring and the people that they, um, I think they interviewed, you know, something like 45,000 people in a year to then fill, you know, a small number of positions. So the, 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 there's a really strong focus on making sure that the people that come into the mix are the right sort of people. So that you're coming into a fairly stressful, high tension um, high stakes environment but it's not created to fuck you up and burn you up because that's not then that doesn't work and and the thing about the, the human sustainability is you can't have one without the other it's it just doesn't work and in fact when you address them um i think one of the problems that um a lot of organizations and i would say a lot of policy is that you take a subject and you look at it in isolation and you don't um, you don't sort of look at the opportunities that can come from sort of broadening the um, the context or the um, like you know you've always got to look at something with boundaries to be able to um, articulate what needs to be done in that space but you've got to always have your finger on the pulse of what the implications and, and, and what the um, impact is. And so when we look at human sustainability, it's, it's um, you know, we've got a health and wellbeing um, program. We make sure that we create a, a, a diverse and inclusive environment so everybody can feel welcome. And, and you know, we, there's, we do all the stuff around language, making sure that you know, there's appropriateness, appropriateness of language um, our buildings are designed to make sure that you know, they're accessible to everybody. The product's built so it's accessible to everybody. But there's also the, um, the other sort of um, hard to quantify elements of human sustainability, which is also where, it, where you start to really enrich culture and, and consciousness, subconsciously. And um, again, I'm not saying that food is the, um, it will cure it, it will fix all of the world problems, but I reckon it probably would. It would fix most of them. But one example of different sort of programs and projects that were sort of rolling out of Canva is that we've partnered with um, Black Duck Foods. And Black Duck Foods is Bruce Pascoe's um, uh, sort of um, food and beverage, food growing sort of platform where what they want to do is that they want to um, use Black Duck Foods to, you know, regenerate land um, to also. Um, ensure that the value of traditional knowledge is um, is being recognised, and that there's a proper business model where um, you know the money that you're spending from um, from native ingredients is going to community. Where in Australia, like you, you buy native ingredients, it's like one or two percent of that money is actually going back to the community. And and 
So what we've done with Black Oak Foods is we've sort of given them a little bit of, um, we've, we've partnered with them to then take on their first crops of the flower. And so we're getting this, um, this, this kangaroo grass and we've made some bread. So we get some bread in the camber and we've had a couple of lunches where um, what we do is we basically, as part of our normal food and beverage program, we give people some bread and they go, oh, it's delicious, what's that? And then all of a sudden you start to have a conversation around um, the, the ingredient, this really unique ingredient. And then we're starting to learn language. We start to learn traditional language. Um, and then we had um, Noel, who's Bruce's, the other family partner in Black Duck Foods, that joined us for a couple of lunches and they talk about their, um, their they tell us their story about what it's like to be a, um, an Indigenous Australian and to be a First Nations people of this land. We then had com conversations about um, what, you know, Noel shared with us about being moved off his traditional land, um, what it was like to have, um, you know, a, a white mother and a black father and, and what it was like to be disenfranchised, um, to not really, f and then as we were going along, we were starting to have uncomfortable conversations in a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. And we got to sort of say things that were, can sometimes be hard to say because we were approaching conversations with eggshells. And we got to acknowledge the fact that, you know, we've got 65,000 years of, of this rich, amazing history. The last 200 had been a bit shit. <laughs> Just a bit. Just, Just a, a bit. bit shit. The, the last two, let's, let's get past that to access the opportunities of the rich traditional knowledge that preceded that. And so when we're talking about things such as, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about one of the, um, the, the, if there was something close to a silver bullet, it would be moments like that where we're sort of, we're eating food we're learning, we're sharing stories, we're sharing language, we're meeting, um, we're, uh, our understanding of other has just broadened. Um, we're now experiencing empathy. Um, we're, we're safely feeling an element of discomfort with the very real um, ugliness of recent histories for the Australian First Nations peoples. And, and, and um, and I believe that that sort of stuff, it, it helps sustain us as humans. It, it helps to sort of just, you know, these little moments of humanity remind us why we're here and what we should be doing. And it doesn't mean that um, at the end of that lunch, all the engineers go, fuck that, I'm going to become a farmer. They're still going to be engineers, but they're just being enriched a little bit. They're just, you know, they, they, you've offered them something that... Um, not even offered, I don't know how to quite frame it, but this this thing happened that enriched everybody that was involved. No, I think it's genius what you're doing using food as the platform to kind of create bridges of empathy. Because like you said, it's not something that happens in a two hour diversity and inclusion workshop. Mm. Um, or, you know, here's a, a segment on, you know, indigenous food. It's something that needs like a human touch um, a backstory, usually a personal story, and it's something that's, I guess, um, it's a cumulative, cumulative thing that happens over time. So I think even, um, I think it's genius that you're using food as the platform to get people into these issues and start having these um, uncomfortable conversations because it's, um, it is a unifier food. So even if you think about the travel industry, the whole reason why a lot of people want to travel to different countries and cultures is to experience the food. Oh, yeah. So I think, you know, it's a great um, unifying platform um, to kind of get people talking about things that, that are uncomfortable but need to be addressed for us to kind of move forward yeah. um, collectively as a human, as a human um, race. And I think, you know, you talked about even just doing these initiatives with Bruce Pascoe um, with your sacred lunches that you have. Yeah. And Daniel at Canberra has had such an incredible um, impact on the employees. Like they're just so astounded by the Indigenous wisdom um, that they have about the food and the land and you know how to basically work in harmony with it and it's, it's like it feels really good when people land on conclusions for themselves when they're being presented with the information in, in a way that is sort of um not preachy like um like it, when when Noel was like the first one we did with, with Noel and we actually did Bruce um just last week and like Noel just started to talk about how he 
um, just reads he, how he reads the environment, like how he knows that the mullet are going to be good because there's that flower is is is, is blooming. And um, and the the other part to it, which I think is the really great opportunity that I really will encourage people to explore, is that you know we're in the middle of, we're doing this now as NADOC weeks going on, and, and there's and, and so I think that um from my personal experience, like it's not only it doesn't make you feel good, but there's this um, if there is a growing understanding of the importance of traditional knowledge and how valuable it is to the modern world, like. There is, I know of, um, there are, um, uh, there are my, my partner works in climate science. She works for the Bureau of Meteorology. And, and there's, there was one of the projects that they were doing is like, you know, trying to, um, to, you know, they've got records back, very detailed records back to a certain period. And then there's traditional knowledge that extends back tens of thousands of years. And there's, they're now trying to, um, the boys realize that there's the, there's value in that, but it's like, you know, how do you tap into that? Yeah. And when we're looking at you know things such as like you know tackling climate change, like you know, with if you look at you know Australia, it's this big fucking, it's huge. Australia is a massive chunk of real estate, and rightly or wrongly, we've got this agricultural system which is debilitating the land and it's producing really poor outcomes for everybody involved by a, a, a small few, like it's, and the, so if you were to think like, okay, well, there's a system, it's pretty broken. People are losing um, their incomes. You've got people coming off the land. You've got, um, you know, with the recent bushfires and, and some of the things that are happening with climate change, like, the, there is the collapse of communities at the moment. So yeah. in, in parts of Australia, there are literally, they're not talking about um, rehabilitation. They're, they're talking about winding up. It's it's not about, they're not, um, you know, the, the, in some areas, the, the conversation has shifted from let's just work through this. It's like, no, let's, it's it's resilient management. It's, it's, it's crisis management shit. Yeah. And for us to ignore the traditional knowledge, the custodians of this land that have been here and pretty much have led a very um, successful existence for such a long period of time. And, and where I'm saying the opportunities are, I'm not saying that let's just, you know, um, burn all the buildings and not drive cars. Let's know what is, what is the traditional knowledge? What are the, um, what are the gifts that we can take from the custodians of this land and then incorporate them into the modern desires yeah. so we can have our cake and eat it too. Yeah. And, and the, yeah, ancient wisdom sitting there. Yeah. And, and, you, and the thing is that you can't access that if you're coming to the table going, oh, I've, I've got all the answers because I've got all the technology and all the money. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest... Um, you know, I've recently spent more time researching um, the because I'm from New Zealand and I've got a different culture and history over there and and so I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm a Kiwi in Australia learning about Australian history and the and the challenges facing the First Nations people and it's like and it's just one of the, there's so much sadness to it but one of the things that is just the biggest bummer is that the 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 um, the British turned up thinking they had all the answers. And they just missed it. They just missed what was right in front of them. And it was like, so part of the thing that I'm sort of always conscious of is like, you know, they fucked up big time. They really shit in the bed there. And they've caused all these problems. And we can go on and on about colonialization and all the harm that's come from it. But it's like, we need to wind back that damage. And winding back that damage is, um, in my experience in the last couple of years that I've been really focusing on it, is that, um, you know, when you're talking about the traditional custodians of this land, one of the things that just completely floors me every time is that they're not they're not going nah, fuck off. They're going yeah, let's talk, let's share, and and I'm just like really astounded. I didn't. Oh, I mean, it's a much, they're much better people than I think I would have been. And there was a comment I think made by a journalist that said, "We are lucky they're only asking for equality and not revenge." Oh, 100 percent. I would be fucking burning shit down. I'd be turning over cars. <laughs> right, right. So I think to your point about you know. I mean, and that's why it's amazing having people like you in the world in places like Canberra that are doing, you know, what they can with what they're passionate about to wind things back meaningfully. 
um, incredibly. I think another initiative, um, that um, incredible initiative that you're doing as well is with, with um, Matthew Byrne and his team Beck and Petra at Pure. So I was wondering, um, that's something that's, you know, it's not really on the radar. You guys don't um, really talk about it because you just feel it's something that you should do. But I think it's really important, as I've said to you and Matthew, that more people know that these things exist. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the program that you have with Pure and what made you, I guess, what resonated about Pure that made you go, yep, I've got to support these guys. We've got to be a part of this. Yeah, well, so, I mean, Matt is, um, like, he's probably one of my favourite people in the world. And, and he's, he's one of those one of those souls that you sort of go, well, you know, think if there are people like him that exist, then everything's going to be okay. Um, so, and, and it was really funny, though, when, I'm, when, I met, um, when I met Matt and I met Pure, it was done as I was running a tender for um, a, a client at Barangaroo. And so um, the Pure Foundation, Foundation submitted um, to the tender. And, and I kind of hadn't really heard about them. And then I looked at them. And then I looked at what they saw. And um, I've got this bad habit of being probably the most pessimistic about the things that end up being the best. And um, so when I looked at the Pure Foundation, I was like, it's like, it just didn't feel right because it just, like, it, like, it made sense. And, and I was like, I've looked at these things before where the, you've got these different philanthropic um, entities and like the food and beverage industry is, is fraught with you know, people saying one thing and doing the other. And we stand for this, but we're not going to pay superannuation for our stuff. And all that sort of the duplicity and the lack of integrity that can often come with the space of um, doing things that feel good. And, and, and the other very real element to it is, is, you know, philanthropy is really fucking hard. Yeah. Like it's it's relentless, it's thankless, it's, it's a grind. It's, if you're lucky, and you get it right, then it becomes fashionable for a bit, and then you get all the attention and the funding, and then the rest of the time you're just sort of, you know, knocking on doors and churning like it's. So, sustainable schedules came through, and this is a corporate entity, and I was we were going, well, this isn't going to last for this client because this is going to fall over in eight months. So, and so I had that element of pessimism, and my unconscious bias was straight away went to, um, if philanthropy is not going to work for the commercial corporate environment. So then I probably did way too much. I did more due diligence on um, that and the Pure Foundation than I did on any of the other respondents. And it was only because I was going, so what's the angle? <laughs> why, because he doesn't have a digital footprint because I tried to um, research him as well before we met and he's intentionally very low profile online. Yeah, and it's like, it, we're working on that. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> um, but just his, um, the, the corporate structure, um, the the way that he's he's formed is um, his so the the entity itself um, it is um, completely transparent. It's completely above board. There's just, there is no like he's structured in a way that there's no way even if he really wanted to try and screw the system that he could. Like it's just it, and. Um, his uh, ethics and his business practices were really fucking robust. Like he's like it, it, it was it was everything that he said it was. And then because of, and I'm really glad that I put more due diligence into it was then I ended up having a couple of meetings with them and then I just hung out with them and then I was just like, man, you're a good guy. Like you're a genuinely good person. And then like it was yeah, even to the point like I was going up to Brisbane for business one time and um so after the deal was done, because I was very sort of, you know, I was very careful to not interfere with the process of, for, for my clients. And then and then we just started hanging out. And then I started trying to figure out ways that I could help them. And, I, and, then, and at the time I was doing lots of work for different cor corporate entities. And I just said to him one time, I said, look, man, I, I want to help you out because I want to use my powers for good. I'm sick and tired of like you know, <laughs> presenting these really awesome things to a board and they just sort of go, yeah, but nah. And um. Um, but the the other th and, and there was one time I was like going up to Brisbane and he was like oh I'll get my parents to pick you up from the airport and I was like no dude no don't no seriously I can just get a taxi I'm going up there for the day and then lo and behold his mum and dad picked me up from the airport and and um and I was literally in and out in the plane so it was like they they picked me up they took me to my meeting 
And then we chatted and, oh my God, they're beautiful. Like if you, if you imagine like, see, you know, we're fans of Matt and, and um, Matt wasn't an accident. He's the product of two really beautiful people and great hearts. Yeah. Nice car too. Like he's got an old. <laughs> um, so anyway, I've been I'm waffling in probably one. Um, no, no, not at all. Love it. So one of the opportunities that we um, we saw when we we're looking about the um, the human sustainability and the human equity and how to sort of uh, manifest that. And one of the things that we that um, that so Camp is a really good tech company and, and there's pizza screens and we've got, but we've got also got this really good food and beverage program. And so one of the things that we explored when I very first started was like, you know, um, how do we support the broader community and how do we sort of create opportunities? Um, so Canva already does that with its product. Um, so if you're an NGO or if you're a, a club or you can um, you can apply to get um, Canva for free and, and you, there's lots of, there's a really um, amazing online community that supports um, the, the use of Canva as a product for making the world better. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, um, a tech mentoring um, initiative that they do. Um, there's a, a woman in tech initiative, which is around scholarships and internships. So the, the, there are these sort of things, but one of the things that I've observed over the years is in tech companies, what can happen is that you create these isolated bubbles. So you, you go to a good school, you get a good education, you get an internship, and then you go to a tech company where everything's done for you. And where it's sort of harder to create pathways of opportunity for people that may not have been um, allowed that, um, that sort of way. And so what we also, uh, you know, Matt and I are very passionate about is that, um, that Sometimes when you're when you're younger, and your worldview is sort of dictated by your surroundings, like if you're in a um, if you're born into wealth, then you, know, you don't know what any anything else. If you're born into hardship, then that's what you see. And you know, we sort of wanted to be able to sort of um, we, we we don't want to be at the pointy end of we can't do we can't tackle things such as homelessness and we can't tackle things such as um like some of the really hard social challenges that that we face as a community but what we can do is like what can we can do is we can look at what we what we're really good at and what we can affect and so the partnership with with matt was that and the pure foundation was like you guys are really good at what you do what value can we add? And one of the values that we identified is that um, it's we can we can present people opportunities to a different pathway. And so we ended up creating this pathways project, which was purely just the case of um, you know, there's a couple of young girls that were in the program that they um, that they done a lot of work with. But then sometimes taking the next step, like it's hard to go from. You know, maybe you've been in juvenile detention or you've never had a job and then you get the, the training, but then the real world could be a bit of a, bit of a shock. Like it, sometimes it's hard if you've never worked before to hold a full-time job. And I think that sometimes as a society, we forget that that's actually a real problem. And, you know, there's that thing of like, you know, just fucking work hard, just, you know, just do it. Everyone else has to do it. And it's like, bro, it's not it, like everybody, you know, it, Ideally, we all want to feel that we're contributing to this meaningfully, but sometimes you just got to give people just a little bit of a, a little bit of help. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's not a handout. It's not like going you can do whatever you want. Um, and the other thing that we are really mindful of is that um, if we can get people through our food and beverage program, um, because that's one of the good things about hospitality. Like I remember being at a party like years ago, and this. Um, talking to this lady and did the whole like um, you know what do you do and she's um, she was a guidance counselor and um and for schools and she was sort of um talking, and I was asking her questions about that and and um and and I can't remember the exact conversation but I remember what she said it was like you know and if there's a kid that is probably too smart for a shovel but too dumb for an office job then I generally try to encourage them to be a chef. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'll well, put you um, But the reality is that there's aspects to the food and beverage and hospitality industry, which um, there is a repetition to it. There's like the kitchen and jobs. And there is, so it, th those sort of roles are really quite good for people if they don't have um, like good language skills. Um, I'm not saying that that's the only thing that they can do, but sometimes they're a good conduit because it means that there's a repetition um, to a task that is fairly easy to communicate. And then, um, yeah, so there, there are the, yeah, the, the making coffees and stuff like it. There's a skill to it, but it's um, it, the sort of, that's what I think, you know, that's where hospitality industry can, it, it's really, really impactful. Um, but the thing is that the opportunity that CAMP has is we can use uh, our hospitality component to expose people to what it's like to be in a, a, a schwanky office in Surrey Hills where you get free t-shirts and lunch. And there is, you know, the average age is here is like between 25 and 35. And, and so, you know, being in an environment where this is what, this is a different sort of um, uh, environment to what um, some people some of these people may be in it doesn't mean that this is what we want you, you, it's not about like you have to get a job in the end it's just like here's a different world yeah it's just an entry point isn't it because yeah and, 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 it's, and it's an exposure and then it's like having conversations with people that are outside your your normal group yeah and, and and it's also really awesome where because like it really challenging um, uncomfortable truths about the you know, touching on the um, the challenges facing First Nations people in Australia like you know Aboriginal people like you know, the recidivism rate for people that go get incarcerated is fucking mental like you know it's just the whole system has been skewed so that um, you know it's more likely that you uh, um, that you just stay in the, it's a trap and and so we're what we're really trying to focus on through the pathways project but also with so that it ties in with all the other different things that we're doing um as canva as a product is you know with you know making sure that there's um the right sort of imagery and, and the right templates and we're building language skills and all that sort of stuff so that if if you uh if you happen to be born into a circumstance that's a bit unfortunate and you may get caught up the police at an early age and and you're world is that space then we can present maybe a, a different opportunity or for you to just sort of reframe what reality is and and um i know that's it can be really challenging and if you think that um if your if your knowledge and you as a person is being devalued and you're feeling like you're stuck in a box it's it's sometimes you just need someone to come along and go hey just come here for a bit yeah, because I think what you guys are doing, which is brilliant, is that you're giving them, I guess, access to an opportunity through social capital, which they otherwise would not have had because yeah. of their experiences, their lived experiences as Indigenous people. And I think, to your point, it's not saying that this is where we think you should end up and this is all that you're capable of. It's just saying, here's a starting point for you to kind of almost acclimatise to this sort of environment, this corporate environment, you know, swank office in Surrey Hills, tech company. And then from there, you can kind of, you know, you can launch path into doing anything, but it's just kind of getting that first foot in the door, which seems preventative. For a yeah, lot and, and I think the, the, the real the real opportunity is is that it's um to the th something I'm incredibly passionate about, and that we're um, that the number of people are working on it is it's not, it's not just about creating entry level jobs, but it's creating an environment where it feels that it right that you should be succeeding in that space because others are doing the same, and and it's, it's bad, isn't it? It's like you, if you can't. You can't be it if you can't see it. And if they get used to being around people that are used to succeeding, used to, you know, being able to affect change because of just being themselves, then they hopefully kind of start to embody and embrace that mindset for themselves as well. Yeah, totally. And, and um, you know, the, the double-edged sword of, of the hospitality industry is that, you know, it is good for the entry-level positions, but it's also sometimes it can also be a bit of a trap. So it's also really being mindful of, like, you know, what we're doing with the Pathways Project with Matt, it, we're not just, so on the surface, we're empowering people to make a cup of coffee and, and be able to find, operate in the kitchen, but that's that's not what we, we want from it. Like if we want, we can hire, you know, we, what we want is to explore the, um, the opportunities of empowering people that may have otherwise not have felt empowered to then 
get them to lead and to show us the way. Because in my life experience, I've been more blown away by people that have done awesome shit than those that have just been handed it. So how do you empower people so that they they want to do the best work in their lives and then watch them and then and then let them run with it? Like just fucking like if you've got a vision, go on it. Just like yeah, you like Yeah. Yeah. And I like, think yeah. a lot of it is just driven by pure integrity. And I think there's just a sheer acknowledgement that this is something that's important for Canva to commit to um, is phenomenal. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's not some side, you know, little um, NGO company that is, um, you know, just trying to be woke. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a huge multinational going, yep, this is what we believe in and this is how we're committed to it. Um, and I think a lot of people are scared to do these things because they're scared to do them properly. Um, and they're also scared to look performative right now. And I think, you know, for me, it's, I don't know what your point of view is. I think the easiest way to not be performative is not be performative. Because I think clearly you guys have done a lot of groundwork with Matt um, in making sure that the, pro the Pathways program is robust. It's meaningful. It actually is outcome driven rather than, because that's why you, you know, don't see any PR around it. You guys are just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your future aspirations for the Pathways um, program? future aspirations for are that I want to see how awesome these young girls can be um, and not for any other reason but I just genuinely think that the world will be a much better place if we just encourage people to be awesome yeah. and we can you know we, we started talking about like you know the whole Trump and all that sort of stuff like it I think it's completely okay for people to, you know, be really passionately disagree with the other person. But if you kind of, you know, it's that, like, it's that thing of like, you know, the world would be a better place if we just didn't have dicks. Just don't be a dick. <laughs> like it's like, you know, you can, you can, like a bumper sticker. <laughs> just don't be a dick. Like it's pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. And, and it doesn't mean that you can't be aspirational. It doesn't mean you can't be competitive. And and um and so the I don't really I don't, there isn't like an articulate. There's not like a box or a, a certificate at the end of the pathways project. I actually just think it would be the opportunity that I um, think that I would love to be able to um, to to uh, continue to uh, facilitate is um, with what Matt and the Pure Foundation does is really fucking hard. They are dealing with, with the really hard stuff and complementing their hard work. And this is where I think that we can, what we're focusing on is um, we don't have the skills to do what they do, but we can help transition people to the next step. And then the what we get from that exchange is um, diversity of, of, of people and ideas and opinions and, um, and we, we have a, a richer culture. Um, we have, um, you know, we create these moments of empathy um, and these sort of things like these are all really nice things and they always make us feel good but the reality is that that also builds resilience it, rebuild, it builds a stronger community so when you know this shit hits the fan or we grow or we shrink or whatever as, a, as an organization then we're, we're resilient people we're we're not just going to go um right i'm out the door because my job just got hard it's like right you know it, it's so my utopian, so what I'm trying to create for the pathway zone is that I just really want to see um, people just do really good stuff here or elsewhere. But the exchange, the um, the human exchange that happens during the pathways um, while they're, they're with us is that um, that we get to benefit from the opportunities of that, that human exchange and that cultural sort of um, diversity and understanding. And the 
just because um, over the last five years of dealing with corporates, I'm used to putting everything on a spreadsheet and a ledger. It's demonstrable that when you've got um, a bunch of humans that are focused on doing good work, good work's generally achieved. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you want to make the best company in the world, you, you've got to have the best people. And that doesn't necessarily mean the guy with the degree. No, no. Yeah, and I think it, it's well worlds apart, like people like yourself, we just kind of accept that this is the way forward, it, just because it is. Just from a human integrity point of view, it actually makes a lot of commercial sense. I had a very frustrating conversation with an industry body that will remain nameless, and they're still saying, oh, but maybe we need to kind of demonstrate to the leaders the economic benefit of diversity for them to move on it. And I'm like, you guys can Google. There's a ton of reports McKinsey have, like, everywhere. If you can't work that out as a leader, then you're going to be outdated in the next three to five years. So I think that, you know, from my perspective, like, gravitating towards people like yourself that just get it and are actually, like, focused on momentum and progress rather than being convinced that this is the right thing to do or the woke thing to do. Yeah. It's, um, it's frustrating. <laughs> frustrating, and I'm not even going to bother talking about them. Um I just think that it's amazing what you're doing. I'm conscious of your time too, Jared. You've probably got back to back to back meetings, but um, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for your time and your insights. Um, I'm so glad you're using your powers for good. <laughs> and that there are people like you in places like Canva with whole hearts and just pure integrity trying to do the right thing to support um, people that otherwise wouldn't have had the right opportunity. And also, yeah, getting people like Matt um, a bit more forward with his message and the incredible outcomes um, he's trying to champion and, you know, doing that together with him. So I just wanted to say yeah. on behalf of humanity and myself for being awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think the, the other really important piece is that um, we don't have an end. Like, we, we, we don't know what this is, how this is going to shape out. Like, it's just one of these things that um, it, having trust in each other's integrity and the desire to do good and knowing that the um, there's not a huge amount of skin in the game for a lot of these corporates. And this is one of the frustrations that we'll probably feel, share that it's like, you don't fucking, it's not gonna, like if you're worried about the cost, then why, there's other things that cost more that are gonna be, just stop thinking about that in such linear terms. Mm -hmm. And then just, um, you know, fall back on, on the, the, human the human collateral and the integrity of the moment, and then, then focus on creating um, positive opportunities where things can flourish from it rather than assuming that there's nothing but blockages. Exactly. Yeah, no, so glad you exist, Jared. Amazing oh, doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> um, and I hope you have an amazing week and we definitely need to catch up IRL, as the kids would say, <laughs> in real life, when the board is open. Yeah, bring down the wall. Yeah, that will happen. I think it's... Um, but yeah, thank you so much and have an amazing week. Yeah, man. Take it easy. See you soon. Bye. Bye.